Shoe Fly Pie by Naomi Shihab Nye. On our way somewhere, we sat at this table, wood clear varnished, a design to hold the days, two people talking toward the center, candlelight on each face. William Stafford. Maddie couldn't believe she dropped the giant honey jar on the floor the moment the boss entered the kitchen after his overseas trip. Have you ever watched a gallon of honey ooze into a slow-motion golden dance around a mound of broken glass? It might have looked glorious if she hadn't been the one who dropped it. The boss stared at her with his deep eyes, his mouth wide open. And you must be, he asked. A secret voice in her head replied, the idiot, the donkey. But her real voice said, the person they hired while you were out of town. Then she said, I'm so sorry. I'm also very sorry about your father, and knelt down. You couldn't exactly use a broom on honey. A shovel, maybe? She had a weird desire to stick both her hands into it, or she might faint. Having never fainted before, she always imagined it as a way to escape a difficult scene. That or going to the bathroom. Excuse me, she'd said many other times in her life. I'll be right back. At her own mother's funeral recently, she'd spent a lot of time in the bathroom with her forehead pressed against the cool tiles. She felt safe, removed from the grief of what was waiting for her back in the world. In this case a huge mess to clean up, and twelve sprouty salads to make pronto. A banquet of orders hung clipped to the silver line strung over the window between the kitchen and the dining room. She could peek out into the happier part of the restaurant, the eating domain, where regular people with purses and backpacks and boyfriends were waiting for their lunches. How had she gotten into this? Long ago, before her mother was diagnosed with cancer, When she still thought she had migraine headaches, Maddie offered to make dinner by herself. She was 12. During the whirl of washing lettuce, hauling fresh peas, stirring spaghetti sauce, and lighting the oven to heat the bread, she'd managed to pull down from the wall the giant shelf over the stove that held matchbooks, tea, boxes, spice jars, recipes, birthday candles, half-empty sacks of Arabic coffee, yellowed grocery list, vitamins, and her mother's favorite cabbage teapot with a china rabbit for a lid. One ear broke off the rabbit, and chips of china fell into the spaghetti pot. Her mother came into the kitchen with a wet rag over her head to see what was happening. Maddie should have known she was destined for disaster. Today, the boss squatted beside her. She felt comfortable to be in the presence of another American of Arab descent, but it didn't seem the right moment to mention it. She'd seen his name on the mail that came in his absence. Despite her clumsiness, he was smiling and mild. Thank you, he said. My father was a good man. As for the honey, I think I'll get one of those big scoops we use for the cooler and take care of it myself. Why don't you go back to what you were doing? Don't worry about it. She stared after him. What a nice voice. Relieved, she turned back to the counter to sprinkle sunflower seeds and shaved cheese over the bowls of lettuce. And there was the empty honey bear sitting with its hat off, waiting for her to refill it for the waitress who had shoved it at her. Maddie would suggest the waitresses take care of such details themselves from now on. Two weeks ago, she'd never even thought about being a cook in a restaurant, and now she was ready to help run the place. The boss could have fired her. Some bosses were mean. She had heard about them from her parents over the years, but suddenly she wanted this job very much. She needed it. She needed the money. But even more, she needed distraction. It was too hard to be home by herself for the summer since her mother had died the first week of June. Her father was at work all day long until supper time. Three days after the funeral, she'd gotten on a bus to ride downtown to the library and, in her distraction, had gotten off too early. She saw the good-for-you restaurant staring her in the face. That's what she needed, something that was good for her. So she stepped inside for a late lunch. After ordering an avocado sandwich with cheese, she'd asked the waitress, 
Do you like working here? It was a cozy environment. Large, abstract paintings, mismatched chairs, real flowers and ceramic vases on each table, ceiling fans, soft jazz playing. The waitress sighed and shrugged. Maddie asked, Do you get to eat for free? Sure, but who needs food? I'm not hungry. You get sick of food when you haul it around all day, she whispered. Anyway, I'm too in love to think about it. With who? Maddie wondered why, when someone else whispered, you whispered back. The guy who washes the dishes, Augie. If you go to the restroom, you can see him through the doorway. He has long blonde hair and an earring. Who didn't have an earring these days? Even men who looked like Maddie's father had an earring. So she walked back to the restroom just to see the love interest of a person she didn't even know, to distract herself from her own thoughts. The dishwasher looked bubbly and clean in his white apron, as if he washed himself between dishes. Slicked up with soap. He grinned at Maddie when he caught her glance. He's cute, Maddie whispered to the waitress upon return. She ordered a bowl of fresh peach cobbler she'd barely eaten in days. The problem with working here right now, the waitress said, is we're so short-handed. Johnny's the main cook, but his grandpa died in Alabama, and he went over to help his grandma out two weeks ago. Plus, our boss, Riyadh, was called to Beirut suddenly for his father's funeral. Everyone is dying. Riyadh's great. He helps out in the kitchen when he's here, but without them both, it's a nightmare. Riyadh thought we needed an extra cook even before everybody left. Do you know anybody who'd like to be a cook? Fueled by her cobbler, Maddie was a danger to society. Plus, if everyone was bereaved in this place, she'd fit right in. I would. Do you have experience? Of course. Who didn't? She'd been inventing sandwiches and slicing elegant strips of celery for years. She made quick stir-fries for her parents and super French toast on the weekends. She'd often made her mother's sack lunches as well as her own. Her mother had taught at a Montessori school where she had to heat up 20 little orange containers in the microwave at lunchtime every day. None of her students ate peanut butter anymore, she said. They ate curries, casseroles, and tortilla soup. Maddie even read cookbooks for relaxation sometimes. While her mother was dying, she couldn't concentrate very well on novels and found herself fixating on women's magazine recipes describing how to make cakes in the shape of baby lambs and chicks. How do I apply? The waitress dragged Sergio, temporary cook in command, to Maddie's table. He had a frantic glaze in his eyes, but asked a few questions and wrote her phone number down. Then he told her to show up to work the next day. That was it. No application form, no interview. Maddie did not say, I want to cook here because my mother just died. But the next day, she'd applied for a health card. Her backpack was stashed under the cash register, and her own white apron was tied around her neck. Augie, the dishwasher, came out wiping his hands to welcome her. Examining the menu closely from her new perspective, Maddie tried to memorize it on the spot, while Sergio juggled salad making with his spreading of mayonnaise on homemade bread. His large hands looked awkward, sprinkling wispy curls of carrot among lettuce and arugula leaves in the lineup of bowls. Looking down onto the top of Maddie's head, he said, Would you wash those flats of strawberries and mushrooms that just arrived? If we don't get these mushroom soups out for dinner soon, which was how Maddie became his goon. She wasn't sure goon was the right word, but that's what she felt like. Do this, do that. He never said please. He gave her the most tedious jobs and quoted Johnny as if Johnny were the god of cuisine. Sergio didn't know the easiest way to peel raw tomatoes, dunk them into boiling water for three minutes, then pluck them out. That was one of the million little things she'd learned from her mother. Would she be remembering them forever? She could hear her mother's voice steering her among the giant spoons and chopping blocks, a hum of kindness, a you-can-do-it familiar tone. Here in this place her mother had never been, it seemed easier to think about her, easier than at home where every curtain, dusty corner, and wilting plant seemed lonesome right now. 
the shoes poking out from her mother's side of the bed, the calendar with its blank square for the last two months. You know, her mother had said when there were just a few days left in her life, this is the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do to you. It was easier right now to be in the madly swirling kitchen her mother had never seen. Well, I don't know, Johnny, okay? Maddie said to Sergio on the fifth day of heavy labor, after she just chopped a line of cucumbers for the daily gazpacho. So he's not such a big deal to me, okay? He will be when he gets back, Sergio said. He was mixing fresh herb dressings. Maddie had snipped the basil up for him with shiny shears. She peeled 50 cloves of garlic in a row. Even her bed at home would smell like garlic soon. She'd fallen immediately in love with the giant shiny pans, families of knives, containers of grated cheese and chopped scallions lined up to top the splendid house vegetarian chili. And she liked the view of the kitchen window into the dining room. She started guessing what a customer would order before the order had been turned in. Every day, the same young woman with short, dark hair came in, sat alone under a cosmic painting, blue planets spinning in outer space, and ordered a veggie burger and a healthy Waldorf salad on the side. She wore dangling earrings made of polished stones and glass. By the end of each meal, she was patting her teary cheeks with a napkin. Was it something she was reading? Maddie had noticed her as she stood next to Sergio, mixing up the date, nut, cream cheese delight in a huge bowl. It didn't take many brains to do that, so she could observe their crowd of eaters. Bodybuilders, marathon runners, practitioners of yoga, religion professors, and students. Do you know that girl? She poked Sergio's side so he almost cut himself. Watch it. Who? The crying one. Huh? Men didn't notice anything. The beautiful one who comes in here every day orders exactly the same thing and starts crying. He stared disinterestedly through the window. Actually, she does look vaguely familiar. Maddie speculated. Maybe she hates our food, but she's obsessive compulsive and can't go to any other restaurant. Maybe she's in love with Augie, too. Maddie asked Riyadh if she could ring the crying customer out. Sure. Do you know how to use the cash register? No. He showed her. That was the greatest thing about Riyadh. He never made anyone feel stupid for not knowing something. Maddie took the girl's bill and rang it up, whispering, Is there anything we can do to make you feel better? The girl looked shocked. Who are you? she asked. I'm the person who puts dressing on your salad and makes your sandwich. I've noticed you through the window, right there. See that little window we have? I started working here a few weeks ago, and you seem upset. I wondered if you could use someone to talk to or anything. The girl looks suspicious. Do you know Johnny, the cook who runs this place? Him again. Maddie said, he's on a trip. I've never seen his face. Just wait, the girl whispered. It's the most amazing face you'll ever see. She shook her head. God, he drives me crazy. Me too, Maddie said. She stepped away from the cash register so Riyadh could ring up someone else. The girl looked confused. But I thought you said... I was just kidding. Sorry. I don't know him. Is he your boyfriend? Well, we were dating before he went to help his grandma. But right before he left, he said we were finished. Well, he didn't say that word exactly, because I don't think he believes in beginnings and endings, but he said we needed to follow different paths. God, I love him. I guess that's why I've been coming so often. I'm hoping he'll be back, and will have changed his mind. Her eyes filled up again. Maddie handed her a Kleenex. Has he called you since he's been gone? Has he written you at all? Nothing. I've called him maybe four times. His grandma always answers and says Johnny's not there. She must be lying. But you see, Johnny hates to talk on the phone. He doesn't believe in it. It makes him feel disembodied. So I don't know if he's really there or if he's simply sticking to his principles. 
Sorry, but he sounds like a nutcase. How old is he, by the way? Her face sobered. Twenty-one, she said. But he says he's ageless. Sergio suddenly stood behind Maddie with a ladle in one hand and a wire whisk in the other. Are you taking a vacation? Or is this a coffee break that I wasn't told about? If you're going to work here, you'll have to carry your weight. It was his favorite dopey phrase. Johnny returned the next day. Sergio was sick and didn't come in. Riyad had to take his wife and babies to the doctor, too, even with the good-for-you restaurant's wholesome cuisine bolstering them, they'd all managed to get the flu. So it was Johnny and Maddie on their own, with one lovesick waitress, another waitress with a sprained ankle, and Augie poking his sudsy head around the corner now and then to see if they needed plates. Amazing face. Maddie couldn't see it. She thought he had an exaggerated square jaw, like Popeye in a cartoon. Huge muscles under rolled-up white shirt sleeves. Deep, dangerous tan. Hadn't he heard about skin cancer? Explosive brown curls circled his hair. He had great hair, yes. He also wore an incredibly tight pair of faded jeans. Maddie couldn't imagine he felt very good inside of them. I'm sorry about your grandpa, she said. Johnny stared at her hard. I didn't realize you knew him. That was mean. No way she would mention her mama when he was as mean as that. She hadn't even told Riyadh or Sergio about her mother yet. Immediately, Johnny started moving everything around. All the implements and condiments she'd rearranged to make them more available in a rush. All the innovative new placements of towels, tubs, cinnamon. Whoosh. He wanted to put things back exactly where they had been when he left. And he was muttering. Rub, rub, rub. How dare anyone juggle the balance of his precious sphere. Here, he roared, lion-like, as he pulled a giant knife out from the lower shelf where Maddie had hidden it, finding it too large to be very useful. Here is the sword of the goddess, my favorite sweet saber. And what is this pie on the specials board that I've never heard of in my life? Shoe fly? Where did that come from? Well... First, from the Amish communities in Pennsylvania. Americana, you know. And now, from me. Maddie had suggested the recipe her second week, since it happened to be her personal favorite pie, and they sold out of it every day. You? He could make the simplest word sound like an insult. You didn't even want to be you anymore. And who are you? She brandished her blender cap. I'm the new chef. Chef. I'm the chef around here. You're the cook, okay? Do you know the difference between the words? I know the difference between lots of words. Between rude and nice, for example. She stalked back to the dishwashing closet. Augie, break a plate over his head, will you? Augie looked shocked. Johnny? Johnny's like the mastermind. He knows everything. Do you know he even built the tables in this place? I don't care. He doesn't know me. She served nine pieces of shoe fly pie that day, arranging generous slices on yellow dessert plates. Maddie savored the sight of their crumbled toppings over the rich and creamy molasses interiors. Her mother used to love this pie. That day, no one ordered buttermilk pie, which apparently had been Johnny's specialty before he went away. His pie was still languishing in its full dish when Maddie wiped the counters at 3 p.m. What's in that pie of yours, he asked her. Niceness. During the lunch rush, Johnny had ordered Maddie around more rudely than Sergio ever did. But now she knew where Sergio learned it. Johnny snapped commands. Saute! Stir! He kept insisting there were granules of raw sugar on the floor under his feet and making Maddie sweep when he had food all laid out. That's very unsanitary, Johnny. To sweep in the presence of food? Didn't your mama ever tell you? Her words seemed to throw him into a funk. When his weepy ex-girlfriend materialized, pressing her face up close to the kitchen window for what she hoped might be a welcome home kiss, he tapped her forehead with his fingertips and busied himself. Any chance we could spend some time together? she asked wistfully. Sharon, you know what I told you. Tears welled up in her syrupy eyes. She said, Johnny, I think I can make you happy. 
as he slapped the dill sauce around a grilled portobello mushroom on polenta. Ouch. The waitress said Augie had been found wrapped in a bubbly embrace in the broom closet that morning when Maddie whipped open the door looking for a mop. Sergio now had a crush on a buff bodybuilder who came in every morning for a peach smoothie dressed in a leopard print tank top. Even Hell's Angels, even Hell's Angel, who appeared only on Saturdays, had slipped Maddie a note that said, Good muffin, baby, drawn inside a heart. Only Riyadh, dear Riyadh, seemed able to focus on food and the work right in front of him. One day after work, Maddie had told him about her own Syrian heritage and her mom's death coinciding with his dad's. Did she only imagine it, or did tears well up in his eyes, too? After that, they both threw Arabic words into their talk. Yalach, speed it up, kalas, enough already. Some days, Riyadh refilled the bins of flour and apricots and sunflower seeds in the grocery section with careful attention. Some days, he polished the front window glass till it glittered. Lots of bosses might never lift a finger. One day, Maddie found him down on his knees on a prayer rug in the cooler, chanting in Arabic. She respected his devotion to service. He told her he had dreamed of owning a restaurant ever since he was a little boy who loved to eat, wandering the streets of Beirut. Only the ten-year war had made him leave his country. Maddie admitted she had trouble with Johnny's attitude. Riyadh whispered, Listen to this. When he first came to work here, he was our baker, not our chef. He asked me, Do I get paid while the bread's rising? Have you been in the service or what? Maddie asked Johnny on her 44th day of work. It was truly summer now. Each day swelled full of 98-degree heat. Midsummer in Texas. People forget. Midsummer in Texas. People forget what a cool breeze ever felt like. Why do you ask? You act like a general. I think you'd like me to salute you. Well, you're full of it, too. He was furious that she had started revising the soup list. Today, she was making a spicy peanut stew from Eritrea with green beans and sweet potatoes. Where is Eritrea, he asked her. And what makes you think our customers will know of it if I don't? East Africa. The whole world is tired of your black bean soup, Commander. It's time to branch out. Johnny always stared at her as if he needed an interpreter. Riyadh went wild when he smelled the peanut stew cooking. I want some. When will it be done? Matty told Johnny the customers were also tired of his boring banquet of alfalfa sprouts on top of his little salads, too. Let's try lentil sprouts for a change. Or nasturtiums. Come on. Basically, she was weary of watering them. She wanted to witness some different curls of life sprouting in the jars under the counters. Anyhow, an East Indian professor on the other side of town had just gotten E. coli that was traced to alfalfa sprouts, and she felt nervous about them. An anonymous food critic from the newspaper had eaten at the restaurant recently and written a glowing review. Happy to say the good-for-you menu offers new sparkle and a delicate, mysterious dessert called shoe fly pie. Not to be missed. Maddie made three extras that day, and they all sold out. A lady bought a whole one for her book club. On the 10th of August, Johnny asked Maddie to sit down after work for a cup of mint tea with him. You think you're really clever, don't you? He said, tapping his spoon on his cup. Not at all, she said, startled. I certainly don't. In fact, I usually think I'm pretty dumb. It's just that you were used to making all the decisions around here, and it's been really hard for you to share them. I don't know why. I certainly wouldn't want to make all the decisions. You wouldn't? No way. I think sharing them is better. You do, do you? He was staring at the top of her head as if she had two horns erupting. Then he said, Would you like to go to a movie with me? And she almost fell over backwards out of her chair. Late afternoon sunlight had suspended in the air. She could smell the warm sweetness of molasses from the pies just out of the oven. Um, I'm sorry. I can't. It's not good to mix business and pleasure. She really wasn't much of a dater. Now and then, she went out with friends in groups, like migrating monarch butterflies or ducks, but she simply could not imagine going around with this troublesome 
chef. He looked thunderstruck. Are you serious? Very. He shrugged. It was a good movie, too. Which one? I'll never tell. Then he hissed. What? You just stick around home with your mama after work and learn new recipes? Tears rose up in Maddie's eyes. He stared at her. My mother, she said, died right before I started working here, for your information. Why didn't you tell me? You weren't here. Plus, when you got back, you weren't very friendly. One thing about loss, you decide whom to share it with. You could go around day after day and never give anyone a clue about what had been taken from you. You could hold it inside, a precious nugget of pain. Or you could say it out loud when you trusted enough, when you felt like it. I didn't feel like it. You could place it on the table. Johnny spoke softly now. I'm sorry, but didn't you know I'd just been at my grandpa's funeral myself? Yes, and he was like a daddy to me. He raised me when my own daddy took off, and my mama was already gone. Now tears shone in Johnny's eyes. It was a restaurant where every single person ended up crying at one time or another. Well, I didn't know that, Maddie said. That must have been really hard. She found herself with her hand on his arm. I'm sorry, too, she said. I know you really loved your grandpa a lot. He looked up sharply. You do? How do you know that? Trust me. So many times during the day, he'd mentioned little things his grandpa used to tell him. How to sharpen a knife. How to swab the decks. What Johnny called cleaning a counter. Now he said, let me tell you about my grandpa's favorite cornbread. And he described it so deliciously, with raw pieces of fresh corn tucked into it, that Maddie had the idea they should concoct a meal based on beautiful things his grandpa used to cook for him when he was growing up. Greens, cornbread, quick-fried okra, sweet potato casserole, vinegar coleslaw, pecan pie, and, since their restaurant didn't serve meat, a special veggie burger seasoned with sage, his grandpa's favorite spice. They could do it in memoriam, privately. But on the board, they just call it from Johnny's Grandpa's Special Recipes. They could even put white daisies on every table because they were his grandpa's favorite flower. The menu was so popular, they kept it up there three whole days. As customers were paying, they said, Johnny, tell your grandpa we loved his food. No one told them he was dead. Then Maddie said, Okay, Riyadh, what did your daddy eat? Your turn. For three days, they served lentil soup, baba ganoush, okra with rice, and falafel sandwiches. They played Arabic music in the restaurant. Riyadh seemed deeply emotional about it. He placed his father's dashing young photograph on the register. He gave Johnny and Maddie raises. Sergio had left them by that time. He'd gone to selling boring used cars over on San Pedro, because he could make three times as much money over there. But it won't taste as good, Maddie told him. They'd hired a grandmother, Lucy, to take his place. Lucy loved their new recipes as well as their old ones. She said, Did you know the name Shoe Fly came about because the Amish people would shoo away the flies that came to land on their cooling pies when they took them out of the oven? Johnny said, We don't have any flies here. Maddie catches them in her fist the minute she sees them. Then they did Maddie's mother's recipes. Maddie had a very hard time deciding which ones to do. Her mother had been a great cook once upon a time, way back in the other world where things were still normal. The menu board featured a special green salad with oranges and pecans, fragrant vegetable couscous with raisins, buttermilk biscuits, and of course shoe fly pie for dessert. I think your mother had a sweet tooth, Riyadh said, staring dreamily at the full plates lined up on the counter. That she did, said Maddie, swallowing hard. Her mother had everything. The best singing voice, the kindest heart, the kookiest wardrobe. She never felt shy about combining checks and stripes and wild colors. Maddie brought in a tape of her mother's favorite blues singer, Lonnie Johnson, to play while they served her food. Maddie's father came over from his office to eat with them. 
This is kind of like that Ann Taylor book, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant, he said. Maddie sat with him. He put his hand over her hand. What a rough summer, baby, Maddie said. It's also like our own private Days of the Dead. On November 2nd, people in South Texas made shrines to their beloved deceased family members or friends, arranging offerings of their favorite foods among the... Do... Arranging offerings of their favorite foods among the lit candles and incense. So who's homesick for shoe fly pie? Asked a diner seated at the next table. It's great. Everybody, Maddie said. Everybody who never lived a simple life. In some ways, you could choose what you remembered and what you did with it. Memories you chose to treasure would never fly away. They were like an adhesive stuck to the underside of your heart. Maybe they kept your heart in your body. Riyadh had an idea that they could offer their in-memoriam menus to the general public, too, letting people bring in groups of recipes belonging to someone they had loved who was gone now, and the good-for-you staff would revise the recipes to become healthier, then serve special meals designated Camille's Favorite Ratatouille Feast or Jim's Special Birthday Dinner. What a thought. Is it creepy? Johnny wondered out loud. Will people feel like they eat here, then they die? No, Maddie and Riyadh said at once. It's comforting. Trust us. How do you think an omelet looks better? Folded over or simply flipped? Should we slice the small strawberries in fruit bowls or leave them whole? Suddenly, Johnny was full of questions. Maddie could barely answer them all. He seemed to have softened somehow, like beans left to soak. Sometimes, when Maddie came into work, she'd stop for a moment inside the door of the restaurant as if she were frozen. She'd stare all around the room. The tables, the chairs, the paintings, the veggie salt shakers, trying to remember how the place had looked to her before she'd known it from the inside out. Now, she had the recipes memorized, the arrangements of provisions on silver shelves inside the cooler, the little tubs the blueberries lived in. Even in the dreams, she could hear the steady clip-clip of the best silver knives against the cutting board. One day, she told Johnny she admired his speed when he had ten things to do all at once. He grinned at her, so he almost looked handsome. He said, Do you ever think how we'll all remember different things when we're old? When the restaurant feels like a faraway shadowy den we once inhabited together, I might remember the glint of the soup tureen in the afternoon light or the scent of Camino, and you might remember the gleam of my ravishing hair. You wish. But she liked him now. She had to admit it. She really liked him. One day, Riyadh said, Everything's changing. He gave Maddie a poem by Rumi to read. The mountains are trembling. Their map and compass are the lines in your palm. The first cold norther had swept down from the skies, and everyone was wearing sweaters. That was the day she resigned. She had too much work to do at school now to keep on working here. Plus, she was feeling steadier. The restaurant had been good for her in all the ways she needed it to be, and she could move on now. She could cook better dinners for her father at home with all her new experience. She could have dinner parties for her friends. It shocked her how Johnny responded to the news of her departure. He shook his head and said, No, 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 baby, as if she were a little dog at his feet. What do you mean, no, no, no? Yes, yes, yes. I have homework piling up on me. I have a major paper to do that I haven't even started. My dad and I haven't even cleaned the house since my mom died. I'll miss this place terribly, but hey, I'll still come in and eat. And maybe you'll go to another movie someday and let me tag along. What do you say? Johnny stared at her. He'd been making shoe fly pie on his own lately. Good thing, because everyone still ordered it. Riyadh and his wife presented Maddie with a mixed bunch of happy-looking flowers and a card. This is your home now, too. We love and appreciate you. Free lunch any time. Johnny kissed her for the first time ever on the top of her right ear. Her mother used to kiss her there.